Exhibit number two is a pocket diary bound in black imitation leather with a golden year, 1947, and a collier in its upper left-hand corner. I speak on this I speak of this neat product of the Blanc Blanc Company, Blancton, Massachusetts, as if it were really before me. Actually, it was destroyed five years ago, and what we examine now, by courtesy of a photographic memory, is but its brief materialization, a penny unfledged phoenix. I remember the thing so exactly because I wrote it really twice. First, I jot down each entry in pencil, which many erasures and corrections. On the leaves of what is commercially known as a typewriter tablet. Then I copied it out with obvious abbreviations in my smallest, most satanic hand in the little black book just mentioned. May 30 is a fast day by proclamation in New Hampshire, but not in the Carolinas. That day an epidemic of abdominal flu, whatever that is, forced Ramsdale to close its schools for the summer. The reader may check the weather data in the Ramsdale Journal for 1947. A few days before that, I moved into the Hayes house. And the little diary, which I now propose to read off, much as a spy delivers by heart the contents of the note he swallowed, covers most of June. Thursday, very warm day. From a vantage point, bathroom window, saw Dolores taking things off a clothesline in the apple green light behind the house. Strolled out. She wore a plaid shirt, blue jeans and sneakers. Every movement she made in the doubled sun blocked at the most secret and sensitive chord of my abject body. After a while she sat down next to me on the lower step of the back porch and began to pick up the pebbles between her feet. Pebbles, my god. Then a curled bit of milk ball glass resembling a snarling lip. Unchuck them at a can. Ping. You can't. A second time. You can't hit it. This is agony. A second time. Ping. Marvelous skin. Oh, marvelous. Tender and tanned. Not the least blemish. Sundays cause acne. The excess of the oily substance called sebum, which nourishes the hair follicles of the skin, creates, when too profuse, an irritation that opens the way to infection. But nymphs do not have acne, although they gorge themselves on rich food. God, what agony! That silky shimmer above her temple, grading into bright brown hair and the little bone twitching at the side of her dust-powered ankle. The Macu girl, Ginny Macu, oh, she's a fright, and mean, and lame, nearly died of polio. Ping! The glistening tracery of down her forearm, when she got up to take in the wash. I had a chance of adoring from afar the faded seat of her roll-up jeans. Out of the long, blonde, Mrs. Hayes, complete with camera, grew up like a fakir's face, like a fakir's fake tree, and after some heliotropic fussing, sat eyes up, glad eyes down, had the cheek of taking my picture as I sat blinking on the steps. Humber Lebel. Friday. Saw her going somewhere with a dark girl called Rose. Why does she weigh? Why does the way she walks? A child, mind you, a mere child, excite me so abominably. Analyze it. A faint suggestion of turned in toes. A kind of wiggly looseness below the knee prolonged to the end of each footfall. footfall. The ghost of a drug. Very infantile, infinitely meretricious. Humbert Humbert is also infinitely moved by the little one's slangy speech, by her harsh, high voice. Later her volley, later heard her volley crude nonsense at Rose across the fence, twanging, twanging through me in a rising rhythm. Pause. I must go, kiddo. 
Saturday, beginning perhaps amended. I know it is madness to keep this journal, but it gives me a strange thrill to do so, and only a loving wife could decipher my microscopic script. Let me state with a sob that today my L was sunbathing on the so-called piazza, but her mother and some other woman were around all the time. Of course, I might have, ha I might have sat there in the rocker and pretended to read, playing safe, I kept away, for I was afraid that the horrible, insane, ridiculous and pitiful tremor that palsied me might prevent me from making my entree with any semblance of casualness. Sunday. Heat ripple still with us, a most Favonian week. This time I took up a strategic position with a bees newspaper and new pipe in the piazza rocker before Elle arrived. To my intense disappointment, she came with her mother, both in two-piece budding suites, black as new as my pipe. My darling, my sweetheart, stood for a moment near me, wanted the funnies, and she smelled almost exactly like the other one, the Riviera one, but more intensely so, with rougher overtones, a torrid odor that at once set my manhood astir. But she had already yanked out of me the coveted section and retreated to her mat near her fossing mama. There my beauty lay down on her stomach, showing me, showing the thousand eyes wide open in my eyed blood, her slightly raised shoulder blades, and the bloom along the incurvation of her spine, and the swellings of her tense narrow nades clothed in black, and the seaside of her schoolgirl thighs. Silently, the seventh grader enjoyed her green-red-blue comics. She was the loveliest nymphed green-red-blue Priap himself could think up. As I looked on, through prismatic layers of light, dry-lipped, focusing my lust and rocking slightly under my newspaper, I felt that my perception of her, if properly concentrated upon, might be sufficient to have me attain a beggar's bliss immediately. But, like some predator that prefers a moving prey to a motionless one, I plan to have this pitiful attainment coincide with one of the various gillish movements she made now and then, as she read, such as trying to scratch the middle of her back and revealing a stippled armpit. But Fat Hay suddenly spoiled everything by turning to me and asking me for a light, and starting a make-believe conversation about a fake book by some popular fraud. Monday. Delectatio Morosa. I spent my doleful days in dumps and dolors. We, Mother Hayes, Dolores and I, were to go to our glass lake this afternoon and bath and bask, but a nacreous morn degenerated at noon into rain and low made a scene. The median age of pubescence for girls has been found to be 13 years and 9 months in New York and Chicago. The age varies for individuals from 10 or earlier so to 17. Virginia was not quite 14 when Harry Edgar possessed her. He gave her lessons in algebra. Je me <laughs> Je m'imagine cela. They spent their honeymoon at Petersburg. Fla. Pit Petersburg. Fla. Fla, 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 fla. What state is Fla? Sorry. <laughs> Monsieur Popo, as that boy in one of Monsieur Humber Humbert's classes in Paris called the poet poet. I have all the characteristics which, according to writers on the sex interests of children, start the responses stirring in a little girl. Clink at jaw, mus muscular hand, deep sonorous voice, broad shoulder. 
Moreover, I am said to resemble some crooner or actor chap on whom Lowe has a crush. Tuesday. Rain. Lake of the Rings. Mama out shopping. L, I knew, was somewhere quite near. In result of some stealthy maneuvering, I came across her in her mother's bedroom, prying her left eye open to get rid of a speck of something. Checked frock. Although I do love that intoxicating brown fragrance of hers, I really think she should watch her hair once in a while. For a moment, we were both in the same warm green bath of the mirror that reflected the top of a poplar with us in the sky. Held her roughly by the shoulders, then tenderly by the temples, and turned her about. It's right there, she said. I can feel it. Swiss peasant would use the tip of her tongue. Lick it out? Yes. Shall I try? Sure, she said. Gently, I pressed my quivering sting along her rolling salty eyeball. Goody, goody, she said, nictating. It is gone. Now the other? You dope, she began. There is not. But here she noticed the pucker of my approaching lips. Okay, she said cooperatively, and bending toward her warm, upturned, russet face, somber Humbert pressed his mouth to her fluttering eyelid. She laughed and brushed past me out of the room. My heart seemed everywhere at once, never in my life, not even when fondling my child love in France, never. Night. Never have I experienced such agony. I would like to describe her face, her ways, and I cannot because my own desire for her blinds. My own desire for her blinds me when she's near. I'm not used to being with nymphs. Damn it. If I close my eyes, I see but an immobilized fraction of her, a cinematographic still, a sudden smooth nether loveliness, as with one knee up under the tartan. Under her tartan skirt, she sits, trying her shoe. Dolores Hayes, ne montre pas vos zambes. This is her mother who thinks she knows French. A poet, a misère, I composed a madrigal to the soot black lashes of her pale grey vacant, vacant eyes to the five asymmetrical freckles of her bob nose, to the blonde down of her brown limbs, but I tore it up and cannot recall it today. Only in the tritest of terms diary resumed can I describe Lowe's features. I might say her hair is auburn and her lips as red as licked red candy, the lower one prettily plump. Oh, that I were a lady writer who could have her pose naked in a naked light. But instead I am lanky, big boned, woolly chested, woolly chested, Humbert Humbert, with thick black eyebrows and a queer accent, and a cesspool full of rotting monsters behind his slow boyish smile. And neither is she the fragile child of a feminine novel. What drives me insane is the twofold nature of this nymphet of every nymph, perhaps, this mixture in my lolita of tender, dreamy childishness, childishness and a kind of eerie vulgarity steaming from the snub-nosed cuteness of ads and magazine pictures, from the blurry pigness of adolescent maidservants in the old country, smelling of crushed daisies and sweat and from very young harlots disguised as children in provincial brothels brothers. And then again, all this gets mixed up with the exquisite stainless tenderness seeping through the mask and the mud, through the dirt and the death. Oh God, oh God. And what is most singular is that she, this Lolita, my Lolita, has individualized the writer's ancient lust, so that above and over everything there is.
Lolita. Wednesday. Look, make mother take you and me to our glass lake tomorrow. These were the textual words said to me by my 12-year-old flame in a voluptuous whisper as we happened to bump into an, one another on the front porch. I out, she in. The reflection of the afternoon sun, a dazzling white diamond with innumerable iridescent spikes quivered on the round back of a parked car. The leafage of a voluminous, voluminous elm played its mellow shadows upon the clapboard wall of the house. Two poplars shivered and shook. You could make out the formless sounds of remote traffic, a child calling Nancy, Nancy. In the house, Lolita had put on her favorite Little Carmen record, record which I used to call dwarf conductors, making her snort with mock derision at my mock wit. Thursday. Last night, we sat on the piazza, the Hayes woman, Lolita and I. Warm dusk had deepened into amorous darkness. The old girl had finished relating in great detail the plot of a movie she and, Lol and Lolita had seen sometime in the winter. The boxer had fallen extremely low when he met the good old priest, who had been a boxer himself in his robust youth and could still slug a sinner. We sat, we sat on cushions heaped on the floor, and L was between the woman and me. She had squeezed herself in the bed. In my turn, I launched upon a hilarious account of my Arctic adventures. The muse of invention handed me a rifle, and I shot a white bear, who sat down and said, Ah! All the while I was acutely aware of L of else nearness and as I spoke I gestured in the merciful dark and took advantage of those invisible gestures of mine to touch her hand, her shoulder and a ballerina of wool and gauze which she played with and kept sticking into my lap and finally when I had completely enmeshed my glowing darling in this weave of ethereal caresses, caresses I dared stroke her bare leg along the gooseberry foos of her sheen, and I chuckled at my own jokes and trembled, and concealed my tremors, and once or twice felt with my rapid lips the warmth of her hair as I treated her to a quick nuzzling, humorous aside, and the cursed her plaything. She, too, fidgeted a good deal so that finally her mother told her sharply to quit it, and sent the doll flying into the dark, and I laughed and addressed myself to Hayes across Lowe's leg, Lowe's legs, to let my hand creep up my nymphet's thin back, and I feel her skin through her body, through her boy's shirt. But I knew it was all hopeless, and was sick with longing, and my clothes felt miserably tight, and I was almost glad when her mother's quiet voice announced in the dark, and now we all think that Lo should go to bed. I think you stink, said Lo. Which means there will be no picnic tomorrow, said Hayes. This is a free country, said Lo. When angry Lo with a Bronx cheer had gone, I stayed on from sheer inertia, while Hayes smoked her tenth cigarette of the evening, and complained of low. She had been spiteful, if you please, at the age of one, when she used to throw her toys out of her crib so that her poor mother should keep picking them up, the villainous infant. Now at twelve, she was a regular pest, said Hayes. All she wanted from life was to be one day a strutting and prancing bat on twirler on a jitterbug. Her grades were poor, but she was better adjusted in her new school than in Pisky. Pisky was the Hayes ham town in the Middle West. The Ramsdale house was her late mother-in-law's. They had moved to Ramsdale less than two years ago. 
Why was she unhappy there? Oh, said Hayes, poor me should I know. I went through that when I was a kid. Boys twisting one's arm, banging into one with loads of books, pulling one's hair, hurting one's breasts, flipping one's skirt. Of course, moodiness is a common concomitant of growing up, but low exaggerates, sullen and evasive, rude and defiant. Stack Viola, an Italian schoolmate, in the seat with a fountain pen. Know what I would like if you, monsieur, happened to be still here in the fall. I'd ask you to help her with her homework. You seem to know everything. Geography, mathematics, French. Oh, everything, answered monsieur. That means, said Hayes quickly, you'll be there. You'll be here. I wanted to shout that I would stay on eternally if only I could hope to curse now and then in my incipient pupil. But I was wary of haze, so I just grunted and stretched my limbs non-comitantly, just, and presently went up to my room. The woman, however, was evidently not prepared to call it a day. It was already lying upon my cold bed, both hands pressed into my face, Lolita's fragrant ghost, when I heard my indefatigable landlady creeping stealthily up to my door to whisper through it, just to make sure, she said, I was through with the Glance and Gulp magazine I had borrowed the other day. From her room, Low yelled, she had it. We are quite a lending library in this house, thunder of God. Friday. I wonder what my academic publishers would say if I were to quote in my textbook Ronsard's La Vermelette Fent or Rémy Velo's Un Petit Mont Fautre de Mousse Delicate, Trace sous le milieu d'un filet scarlate, and so forth. I shall probably have another breakdown if I stay any longer in this house under the strain of this intolerable temptation. By the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride. Has she already been initiated by Mother Nature to the mystery of the menarch? Bloated feeling, the curse of the Irish, falling from the roof, grandma is visiting. Mr. Uterus, a quote from a girl's magazine, starts to build a thick, soft wall on the chance of a possible baby may have to be bedded down there. The tiny madman in his padded cell. Incidentally, if I ever commit a serious murder, mark the Eve, the urge should be something more than the kind of thing that happened to me with Valeria. Carefully mark that then I was rather inept. If and when you wish to sizzle me to death, remember that only a spell of insanity could ever give me the simple energy to be a brute. All this amended, perhaps. Sometimes I attempt to kill in my dreams. But do you know what happens? For instance, I hold a gun. For instance, I aim at a blunt, quietly interested enemy. Oh, I press the trigger all right, but one bullet after another feebly drops on the floor from the sheepish uh, muscle. In those dreams, my only thought is to conceal the fiasco from my foe, who is slowly growing annoyed. At dinner tonight, the old cat said to me with a sidelong gleam of motherly mockery directed at low, I had just been describing in a flippant vein the delightful little toothbrush moustache I had not quite decided to grow. Better don't, if somebody is not to go absolutely dotty. Instantly, low pushed her plate of boiled fish away, all but knocking her milk over, and bounced out of the dining room. Would it bore you very much, quoth Hayes, to come with us tomorrow for a swim in our glass lake if Lowe apologizes for her manners? Later I heard a great banging of doors and other sounds coming from quaking caverns where two rivals were having a ripping row. She has not apologized. The lake is out. It might have been fun. Saturday. For some days already, I had been leaving the door ajar, 
while I wrote in my room. But only today did the trap work, with a good deal of additional fidgeting, shuffling, scrapping, to this guy's her embarrassment at visiting me without having been called. Low came in, and after pottering around, became interested in the nightmare curly cues I had penned on a sheet of paper. Oh no, they were not the outcome of a belletrist's bel inspired pause between two paragraphs. They were the hideous, they were the hideous hieroglyphics which she could not decipher of my fatal lust. As she bent her brown curls over the desk at which I was sitting, Humbert the horse put his arm around her in a miserable imitation of blood relationship, and still studying, somewhat short-sightedly, the piece of paper she held, my innocent little visitor slowly sank to a half-sitting position upon my knee. Her adorable profile, parted lips, warm hair, were some three inches from my bared eye tooth, and I felt the heat of her limbs through her rough, tomboy clothes. All at once I knew I could kiss her throat or the wick of her mouth with perfect impunity. I knew she would let me do so, and even close her eyes as Hollywood teaches. A double vanilla with hot fuge hardly more unusual than that. I cannot tell my learned reader, whose eyebrows I suspect have by now travelled all the way to the back of his bald head, I cannot tell him how the knowledge came to me. Perhaps my appear, my ape ear <laughs> had unconsciously caught some slight chance change in the rhythm of her respiration. For now she has no for now she was not really looking at my scribble but waiting with curiosity and composure. Oh, my limpid limpet. For the glamorous lodger to do what he was dying to do. A modern child, an avid reader of movie magazines, an expert in dream slow close-ups, might not think it too strange, I guess, if a handsome, intensely virile, grown-up friend, too late. The house was suddenly vibrating with voluble Louise's voice telling Mrs. Hayes, who had just come up home, about a dead something she and Leslie Thompson had found in the basement. And little Lolita was not one to miss such a tale. Sunday. Changeful, but tempered, cheerful, awkward graceful with the dark grace of her coltish subtins, excruciatingly desirable from head to foot, old New England for a lady writer's pen, from the black ready-made bow and bobby pins holding her hair in place to the little scar on the lower, lower part of her neat calf, where a roller scooter kicked her in pisky, a couple of inches above her rough white sock. Gone with her mother to the Hamiltons, a birthday party of something, full skirted gingham frock. Her little doves seem well formed already. Precocious pet. Monday. Rainy morning. Ce matin gris y doux. My white pajamas have a lilac design on the back. I am like one of those inflated pale spiders you see in old gardens, sitting in the middle of a luminous web and giving little jerks to this or that strand. My web is spread all over the house as I listen from my chair where I sit like a willy wizard. Is low in her room? Gently I tug on the silk. She's not. Just heard the toilet paper cylinder make its staccato sound as it is turned. And no footfalls has my outflung filament traced from the bathroom back to her room. Is she still brushing her teeth? The only sanitary act low performs with real zest. No. The bathroom door has just slammed, so one has to feel elsewhere about the house for the beautiful warm colored prey. Let us have a strand of silk descend the stairs. I satisfy myself by this means that she is not in the kitchen. 
not banging the refrigerator door or screeching at her detested mama, who I suppose is enjoying her third cooing and subduedly mirthful telephone conversation on the morning. Well, let us grope and hope, Ray like. I glide in thought to the parlor and find the radio silent, and Mama still talking to Mrs. Chatfield or Mrs. Hamilton, very softly flushed, smiling, capping the telephone with her free hand, denying by implication that she denies those amusing rumors, rumor, rumor, whispering intim intimately, as she never does, the clear-cut lady in face-to-face -face talk. So my nymphet is not in the house at all. Gone. What I thought was a prismatic weave turns out to be but an old grey cobweb. The house is empty, is dead. And then comes Lolita's soft, sweet shackle through my half-open door. Don't tell mother, but I've eaten all your bacon. My breakfast tray, lovingly prepared by my landlady, leers at me, toothlessly, ready to be taken in. Lola, Lolita. Tuesday. Clouds again interfered with that picnic on that untainable lake. Is it fate skimming? Yesterday I tried on before the mirror a new pair of bathing trucks, trunks. Wednesday. In the afternoon, Hayes, commonsensical shoes, tailor-made dress, said she was driving downtown to buy a present for a friend of a friend of hers. And would I please come too, because I have such a wonderful taste in textures and perfumes. Choose your favorite seduction, she purred. What could Humbert, being in the perfume business, do? She had me cornered between the front porch and her car. Hurry up, she said as I laboriously doubled up my large body in order to crawl in, still desperately dis devising a means of escape. She had started the engine and was genteely swearing at a backing and turning truck in front that had just brought old invalid Miss Opposite a brand new wheelchair. When my Lolita's sharp voice came from the parlor window, You! Where are you going? I'm coming to. Wait! Ignore her, yelled Hayes, killing the motor. <laughs> Alas for my fair driver. Low was already pulling at the door of my side. This is intolerable, began Hayes, but Low had scrambled in, shivering with glee. Move your bottom, you, said Low. Low, cried Hayes, side glancing at me, hoping I would throw Root Low out. And behold said Low, not for the first time, as she jerked back, as I jerked back, as the car leapt forward. It is intolerable, said Hayes, violently getting into second, that a child should be so ill-mannered and so very persevering, persevering when she knows she is unwanted and needs a bath. My knuckles lay against the child's blue jeans. She was barefooted. Her two nails showed remnants of cherry red polish and there was a bit of adhesive tape across her big toe. And God, what would I not have given to kiss then and there those delicate boned, long toed, monkeyish feet. Suddenly her hand slipped into mine and without any chaperon's seeing I held and stroked and squeezed that little hot paw all the way to the store. The wings of the driver's marlinesque nose shone, having shed or burnt up the ration of powder, and she kept up an elegant monologue and in uh, the local traffic, and smiled in profile, and pouted in profile, and bit her painted lashes in profile, while I prayed we would never get to that store, but we did. I have nothing else to report, save Primo, that Big Haze had Little Haze sit behind on your way home, and Secundo, that the lady decided to keep Humbert's choice for the backs of her own shapely ears. Thursday. 
We are paying with hail and gale for the tropical beginning of the month. In a volume of the Young People's Encyclopedia, I found a map of the states that, that a child's pencil had started copying out on a sheet of lightweight paper, upon the other side of which, counter to the unfinished outline of Florida and the Gulf, there was a mimeographed list of names referring evidently to her class at the Ramsdale School. It is a poem I know already by heart. Angel Grace, Austin Floyd, Bill Jack, Bill Mary, Buck Daniel, Daniel Byron Marguerite, Campbell Alice, Carmine Rose, Chatfield Phyllis, Clark Gordon, Cowan John, Cowan Marion, Duncan Walter, Falter Ted, Fantasia Stella, Flashman Irving, Fox George, Glaive Marvel, Goodale Donald, Green Lucinda, Hamilton Mary Rose, Hayes Dolores, Honeck Rosaline, Knight Kenneth, McCool Virginia, McChrystal Vivian, McFaith Aubrey, Miranda Anthony, Miranda Viola, Rosato Emil, Schlenka Lina, Scott Donald, Sheridan Agnes, Sherva Oleg, Smith Hazel, Talbot Edgar, Talbot Edwin, Wayne Lul, Williams Rolf, Windmuller Luis. A poem, a poem forsooth, so strange and sweet was it to discover this Hayes Dolores, she, in its special bower of names, with its bodyguard of roses, a fairy princess between her two maids of honor. I'm trying to analyze this spine thrill of delight it gives me, this name among all those others. What is it that excites me almost to tears, hot, opalescent, thick tears that poets and lovers shed? What is it, the tender anonymity of this name with its formal veil, Dolores, and that abstract transposition of first name and surname which is like a pair of new pale of gloves or a mask. Is mask the keyword? Is it because there is always delight in the semi-translucent mystery, the flowing charshaft through which the flesh and the eye you alone are elected to know smiling passing at you alone? Or is it because I can imagine so well the rest of the colorful classroom around my dolorous and hazy darling? Grace and her ripe pimples, Jeannie and her lagging leg, Gordon, the haggard masturbator, Duncan, the full-smelling clown, nail-beating Agnes, Viola of the blackheads and the bouncing bust, pretty Rosaline, dark Mary Rose, adorable Stella, who has let strangers touch her, Ralph, who bullies and steals, Irving, for whom I am sorry, and there she is, there, lost in the middle, gnawing a pencil, detested by teachers, all the boys' eyes on her hair and neck, my Lolita. Friday. I long for some terrific disaster, earthquake spectacular explosion. Her mother is messily but instantly and permanently eliminated, along with everybody else for miles around. Lolita whimpers in my arms. A free man, I enjoy her among the ruins. Her surprise, my explanations, demonstrations, ululations, idle and idiotic fancies. A brave Humbert would have played with her most disgustingly yesterday, for instance, when she was again in my room to show me her drawings, school art were, he might have bribed her and got away with it. A simpler and more practical fellow would have soberly stuck to various commercial substitutes. If you know where to go, I don't. 
Despite my manly looks, I am horribly timid. My romantic soul gets all clammy and shivery at the thought of running into some awful, indecent unpleasantness. Those ribald sea monsters. Mesalesi. Mesalesi. Annabelle skipping on one foot to get into her shorts. I see sick with rage, trying to screen her. Same date, later, quite late. I have turned on the light to take down a dream. It had an evident antecedent. Hayes at dinner had benevol benevolently proclaimed that since the weather bureau promised a sunny weekend, we would go to the lake Sunday after church. As I lay in bed, erotically musing before trying to go to sleep, I thought of final scheme how to profit by the picnic to come. I was aware that Mother Hayes hated my darling for her being sweet on me, so I planned my lake day with a view to satisfying the mother. To her alone would I talk, but at some appropriate moment I would say I had left my wristwatch or my sunglasses in that glade yonder and plunge with my nymphet into the wood. Reality at this juncture withdrew, and the quest of the glasses turned into a quiet little orgy, with a singularly knowing, cheerful, corrupt and compliant Lolita behaving as reason knew she could not possibly behave. At 3 a.m. I swallowed a sleeping pill, and presently a dream that was not a sequel but a parody revealed to me with a kind of meaningful clarity, the lake I had never yet visited. It was glazed over with a sheet of emerald ice and a pockmarked Eskimo was trying in vain to break it with a big axe, although important mimosas and old anders flowered on its gravely banks. I am sure Dr. Blanche Schwartzmann would have paid me a sack of shillings for adding such a livid dream to her files. Unfortunately, the rest of it was frankly eclectic. Big Hayes and Little Hayes rode on horseback around the lake, and I rode too, dutifully bobbing up and down, bow legs straddle, although there was no horse between them, only elastic air, one of those little omissions due to the absent minus of the dream agent. Saturday. My heart is still thumping. I still squirm and emit low moans of remembered embarrassment. Dorsal view, glimpse of shiny skin between t-shirt and white gym shorts, bending over a window sill in the act of tearing off leaves from a poplar outside while engrossed in torrential talk with a newspaper boy below, Kenneth Knight, I suspect, who had just propelled the Ramsdale Journal with a very precise thought into the porch, I began creeping up to her, crippling up to her, as pantomimistics say. As pantomimists say. My arms and legs were convex surfaces between which, rather than upon which, I slowly progressed by some neutral means of locomotion, humbered the wounded spider. I must have taken hours to reach her, I seemed to see her through the wrong end of a telescope, and toward her taut little rear I moved like some paralytic on soft distorted limbs in terrible concentration. At last I was right behind her when I had the unfortunate idea of blustering a trifle, shaking her by the scruff of the neck and that sort of thing to cover my real manege, and she said in a shrill brief whine, Cut it out. Most coarsely, the little wench, and with a ghastly grin, hammered the humble, beat a gloomy retreat while she went on wisecrack, wisecracking streetward. But now listen to what happened next. After lunch, I was reclining in a low chair trying to read. Suddenly, two deft little hands were over my eyes 
She had crept out from behind as if reenacting in a ballet sequence my morning maneuver. Her fingers were a luminous crimson as they tried to blot out the sun, and she uttered hiccups of laughter and jerked this way and that as I stretched my arms sideways and backwards without otherwise changing my recumbent position. My hand swept over her agile, giggling legs, and the book, like a slate, left my lap. My lap. And Mrs. Hayes strolled up and said indulgently, Just slap her hard if she interferes with your scholarly meditations. How I love this garden! No exclamation mark in her tongue. Isn't it divine in the song? No question mark either. And with a sign of fiend content, the obnoxious lady sank down on the grass and looked up at the sky, and she leaned back on her splayed-out hands, and presently an old grey tennis ball bounced over her, and Lowe's voice came from the house, hotly. Pardonne, mother, I was not aiming at you. Of course not, my hot downy darling. <laughs>